Welcome everyone. I'm Rosemary Bartlett with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on IECC Compliance Pass, which is actually the first in the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Code Commentator webinar series that we're kicking off. A webinar will be held the second Thursday of every month at this same time, so keep watch on BECP's training page as topics get added. Hey, and if you have any topic suggestions you'd like us to consider, would you please email those to me? My email's in your webinar reminder messages. Our speaker today is Shauna Mazingo from Colorado Code Consultants, and we appreciate her taking the time to share information on the IECC compliance pads with us today. Shauna, it's all yours. Thanks, Rosemary. This is, uh, again, this is Shana Mazingo, and hopefully uh, today we're going to talk about the Energy Code Compliance Pass, how to utilize this code to build the project that you want, get and um, show you all the different paths of compliance to get there. So hopefully today what we're going to look at is what is the flexibility that's built into this code? How can we build the building that we want to and still comply with the code? We're going to look at how uh, the prescriptive test comes in, com check, res check, maybe how does ASHRAE 90.1 fit into the picture, energy raters, different software tools. We're going to look at all of these items to see how they play a part in the code, what kind of documentation we need. Some of the objectives that we have today is uh, to look, again, at that flexibility and the ver variety of paths. How do we identify the prescriptive path and the requirements that we need for that and the documentation needed for that? How do we identify the UA alternative path? And where does res check and com check fit into that picture? What are the performance paths out there? And what do those softwares have to do? And what kind of reporting do we need? So we're going to hopefully uh, look at all of these items today and have a better understanding when we're done. A couple of things that we have to do first is to learn how to actually use this code to, to navigate through it. So the code is broken up into commercial and residential chapters. Uh, this, in the 2015, they brought in a chapter five for both commercial and residential that ends up being the uh, existing building chapter. So it tells you everything you need to do for code compliance for existing and uh, historic buildings, and that's new to the 2015. Another thing we need to know before we can use the code is the difference between a commercial building and a residential building. I get a lot of confusion on this topic, especially when it comes to multifamily buildings. So the definition of the residential building that we're talking about is anything that's built under the, the IRC, those one or two family dwellings and those townhouses. Uh, and then also there are some buildings built out of the IBC, those R2, R3, and R4 buildings. As long as they're three stories or less, they use the residential chapters. So you might have an apartment building that has to comply with one of those residential paths. And then it says, you know, er everything else is a commercial building. So the, all those are occupancies over uh, three stories plus all of your other occupancies out of the IBC would be a commercial building. What do we do when we have a mixed-use building? We have this. Uh, we might have to use two different chapters of the code. So we might use the commercial chapter for that bottom level that might be retail or business, and then we have apartments above, and as long as the building is three stories or less, which that would be using the residential chapter for those floors that are our occupancies. Once the building gets to four stories or more, the commercial chapter is used for the entire building. So it's just important to keep in mind that little bit of a difference in at bringing those R2s uh, into as, as a residential and not commercial if they're three stories or less. Now the thing we need to keep in mind is the actual scope of this code. A lot of times we think that it only applies to the building, but it also applies to the building site and any of those associated systems as long as they serve the function of that main building. So that's why we see in the code requirements for you know the on-site renewables or for pools or for your exterior lighting. It may not necessarily be on and attached to the building, but they serve the function of that building. So there are requirements for those as well. Just important to keep in mind those aspects. When we get into the energy code, it feels a, a lot like a juggling act. How do, we, how do we keep flexibility built in so we can build what we want to, still maintain the health and safety of the building, keep our building durable, save some energy in the process, and not hinder 
innovation and technology. These are all those things that we're looking at when we're um, writing this code and, and and looking at the requirements of the code. Or how do we how do we do maintain all of these things at the same time? So when, as we go through the requirements today, you'll see that the flexibility built into this path is trying to take all of those things into consideration. One way of doing that is through alternate methods of materials. So we've always allowed alternate methods of material that the code official uh, decides that that what you're proposing to do as an alternate method could meet the intent of the code, then he could allow it as an alternate method of material. New to the 2015, at least in the residential provisions, it says it, it's good to you have to meet the intent of the code, but you also have to whatever method or material you're using has to at least meet the equivalent prescribed value of the code too. So you know, there's this new organic mushroom insulation out there. Uh, if I want to propose to use that, I have to give some su substantiation to the code official saying that mushroom insulation will at least meet the R value of what's prescribed for my climate zone. There's some flexibility by allowing above code programs. So I could say maybe I want to use uh, lead for homes or, or commercial building, or I want to use Energy Star, or I want to use ICC 700, the National Green Building Standard, or ASHRAE 189, or International Green Construction Code. These are all above code programs that are allowed, and the code says that you know we can't. If the code official chooses, he could allow those as meeting the intent of this code. But but even if you use those above code programs, it's still important to remember you still have to do the mandatory items uh, in the code, like which are things like equipment sizing and sealing your ducts and making sure your your buildings are tight. There's still mandatory items in this code that have to be met, but if you use those other above code programs, all of the other requirements are deemed to be satisfied. So that's some good flexibility built in. Let's start with residential. So residential, we have a few different pathways. The 2015 brought in a new pathway. Look at how do we build what we want to build and still uh, comply with the code. First, there's the prescriptive path. That's just, you know, tell me what I have to do, and that's what I'll do. And I go in there, and I look at the code section in 402 and determine what do I need to do for the building envelope. I look in 403, what do I need to do prescriptively for my mechanical? What do I need to do for lighting? And it's gonna, and we just walk through the code and find out what we need to do. So there's a R value table that I can use, but there's also a U factor table that I could use. And there's performance approaches or a UA alternative approach that we can use as well. What are those and how do I navigate through those to get to my end result that I'm after? Let's look at that. So here's the R factor or the R value table. This is that um, this is that table that just says, okay, if I if I want to go prescriptive by the book, then I have all of these uh, components across here that that I need to comply with if they're inside my thermal envelope. If I'm in climate zone two, I need to have a 0 .40 window, I need to have R13 in my wall, and so on. And so you can just comply with this prescriptively. In climate zone five, where I'm at in Colorado, I have to have an R20 in my two by six wall. Well then, so this is just a, you know, a by the book approach. There's also an option to use uh, uh, different tables prescriptively, and we'll look at that. But one thing that you have to keep in mind whenever you're doing the prescriptive compliance path, it's just telling the code official that's the path you chose. You're going to use all. You're going to somehow on on your plans or in your documentation, you're going to let them know that you met all of those requirements of that table for the U values and your R uh, your U factors and your R values. And then you're also going to have to be able to detail all of your mandatory items on the code. Turn in your um, load calculations. Make sure you have uh, your equipment sizing done. Make sure that your lighting meets the prescriptive requirements of 404. Did you seal all your ducts? And are you going to have to test because you have ducts in unconditioned space? Those kind of things all are mandatory requirements that still have to be met. So if you choose that prescriptive path, you just make sure that you still detail out all of this information on the plan. But what if I don't want to do R20 in my wall? I want to do R19. 
can I still do that without having to jump to one of those other paths, uh, a UA alternative or a performance path? Can I still do that? The code gives you this uh, U-factor alternative, but that exact same table as the prescriptive table, uh, R-value table, same components across the top, same climate zone. It's just looking at all of these components as an assembly. So what is the U-factor for the entire assembly? The other table, just we just looked at the R-value that we put on that wall. R, it would require me in climate zone 5 an R20. This table lets me look at the entire assembly, and maybe I can get away with that R19 if I can calculate my assembly out to meet that 0.060 uh, U factor. So it's look, what is the U factor for all of the materials, the entire assembly of the wall, and maybe I can get away with it that way. Um, maybe I'm doing better framing. Maybe I'm doing uh, a great system on the outside, I look at every layer of the assembly and add it up and that's how I meet the U factor. You can see that uh, an example would be if I did a U factor, if I converted uh, R20 that's required in climate zone 5, I would only get an R16.67. So how does that equal? Well, because you're not just looking at the insulation, you're looking at the framing and uh, the whole assembly and as long as I get all of that U factor added up to be the 0.060. I could do that. So some people do that. Uh, very few, if I were just going to do one component but I didn't want to have to comply with that envelope, I could do this. Very few do this because this is the same kind of thing that's behind the scenes uh, in the UA, uh, the total UA alternative path that, with the reg check and everything. And so very few people take the time to calculate this out. You could go with this total UA alternative. This is a great path. This uh, it's starting to allow some trade-offs uh, in the thermal envelope. Anything that can be converted to a U factor can be traded off within that envelope. So this is looking at the whole sum of all the U factors of the assembly for the entire building. Instead of just components, it's looking at the whole building. So it calculates. Uh, you, you get this budget for the whole building based on your square footage, and then you just need to stay under that. So this is a, a great path. Uh, it's kind of looking at what can I do to lower my U factor of the building and maybe still get away with something, or maybe I don't want to put in this in R20, I want to put in R19, or maybe I don't want to put in 0.32 windows, I want to put in 0.34 windows. How can I do that uh, and still comply with the code? And so it's, it's giving, it gives you credit uh, for better design. Maybe if I put in less wood, I can get more insulation in the building. And so uh, if I, you know, wood has maybe an R value of one per inch, where I can get a lot more R value out of insulation. So maybe I can take some of that, if I do a two by four framing it, or a two by six framing at six, uh, 24 inches on center instead of 16 inches on center. Ah, less wood, more insulation. I could get credit for that. Maybe if I do, you know, put in better corners and I can get insulation all the way back in the corners instead of um, doing these old type of corners that we used to do where it's nothing but wood, I'm going to get a better U factor this way. It takes into consider thermal bridging. Anything we can do to reduce thermal bridging. Instead of doing 16 inches on center, go 24 inches on center. Look how much insulation you would get in there and how much less wood. It's taking these kind of ideas to still get code compliance and maybe do something different. This is a great website, by the way, this Building America Solution Center. Uh, this is a, you know, this is, they've got great resources there, so be sure to check that out. Maybe I want to do, maybe I'll do continuous insulation on the entire uh, outside of my building and I'm not required to. Look at how much credit I could get for that continuous insulation and maybe offset the kind of windows that I have to put in or maybe I don't want to do slab edge insulation. Hopefully you put it in, but you know, you might want to trade out of that because it's not convenient to do. So you, you take the credit for the things that you're doing and uh, and offset what the things that you that you're not wanting to do. Maybe uh, you know this is a 0.35 window. I want to put in a 0.35 window. That's 
less than what the code would allow. Um, so you you can make it up because you put all of that exterior continuous insulation on the building. Maybe it just looks at it converts everything to a U factor, and as long as you stay under budget, you're good. It takes this twin house concept into consideration. So I have I have the house. It's modeling it. Uh, it's modeling these two houses. I have this house, same square footage, same cardinal direction. Here's how I. Here's this house. If I built it to the 2015 IECC, here's my budget U factor that I would have. But how do I really want to build it? What windows do I really want to put in? What insulation do I really want to put in? Let's take that, and you calculate that U factor of the entire building. And as long as you're staying less than or equal to the prescriptive house, you're good. You have a budget and you just stay under budget. It's fun to calculate all of that. How do we do that? Uh, RegCheck is a great tool, free download from uh, energycodes.gov that handles it for us. It doesn't mean you have to use RegCheck. You could calculate it all out and turn in those calculations, uh, but why do that? When this is RegCheck, it's uh, such a great tool. So if you look at RegCheck, you download the most recent version from uh, energyclubs.gov, and it's so simple. You go through and you tell it, here's my project, where I'm building it, how many square feet, what kind of a building it is. It's a lot of drop-down menus, so easy to use. You tell it everything about your building, and then you just go in and you pick, okay, here's the kind of truss I'm doing, here's the kind of wall that I'm doing, here's, here's the doors and the windows, and, the floor. and you tell it everything about your envelope that you're doing, all drop-down menus on here, so easy to use, great help menus, and what it does is start building you a budget, saying, okay, if you built this to the prescriptive requirements, here's the budget that you would get in U-Factor. And then you would go in and tell it what you're doing and say, okay, well, Here's, based on what you're telling me you're going to do, here's the U factor that you came up with. You are better, you pass, because you're 4.5% better than code in this instance. So it's a, it's a great tool, lets you know if you're over budget or under budget. Uh, gives you, it prints out a compliance certificate that's mandatory in the code. It prints out handy inspection checklists. Uh, and so that's a great, the reports are wonderful to use. Um, you know, if you're a code official and you're looking at this report, it's always important to verify, did they use the right edition of the code? Did they use the right climate zone uh, in their compliance? Did they get that green line? It'll, it'll be green if they pass. It'll be red if they fail. It also gives you uh, on that line the maximum UA, but, but what and what they came in at under budget. So those are helpful uh, things to look at. I always know if somebody uh, doesn't think I'll look at it because they'll turn me a red, a red chicken with a red line. It'll let you know if you failed and how much. I ran one on my house. <laughs> I got 250% worse than code. Um, okay. So uh, other things to look at when you're on a red check, it's great. You can go in here and compare these uh, wall assemblies to see is this what the plan show? Did they say that they're doing this a uh, 10 foot high wall? Uh, or do they do say that this is the window that they're going to use, that this is, you know, how many doors are in the envelope? You just compare this to the plan. I also compare that to the manual J load calculations to make sure that the guy designing the piece of equipment has also designed it to a way to what these guys, are, or what the res check is saying. Are they using the same assemblies? Or are they using the same R values and U factors? I do verify that you know you have the right square footage, that you have what kind of insulation and uh, that you're putting in there, cavity, continuous. I verify that according to the manual J and the plan. What the U factor is for the windows, is that what they're really putting in? And it calculates a budget for you. So you'll see I make them sign it so that I can just let, you know, it lets me know that they put some thought into it. Somebody had to sign it and, and sign off on it. So it's a great tool. Print out that little certificate that the code says is mandatory. Uh, so that's nice. That you can used to be required on the uh, electrical panel. It's now allowed any unconspicuous spot somewhere in the house. Uh, and so it's that's nice that it prints that out. It also prints out this great checklist based on what you put into the house. Here's the items that you need to to look at in inspection for this for this house. So that's a great tool for plan reviewers and for uh, especially inspectors. 
red check only deals with the building envelope because the QA pass only talks about the building envelope. It doesn't deal with mechanical or um, lighting. Again, free download energycodes.gov. You just go to the website and there's a link to download res check or com check. Um, it's a great tool. This website, energycodes.gov, very great website. A lot of a lot of information in there, so be sure to utilize that website. All right. So that's prescriptive UA uh, looking at the envelope. Just looking at the envelope. Now Let's take a look real quick at how the houses have changed. So you have this 1910 house versus this 2015 house. How have the houses changed over the last hundred, over you know, over the last hundred years? Why is this hundred-year-old house still standing? Well, it's standing um, because it was leaky. Right? <laughs> Things uh, it, it was so leaky, uh, the walls were able to dry to the inside or to the outside. They were able to dry, and that's great. But uh, what's happened is the fact that we've changed over the last hundred years. So um, our expectations have changed. So what is it that, uh, why is this house not okay anymore? It's still standing. Why is it not okay for us? Because we've changed. Our expectations have changed. Back then in this house you knew you sat around, you know, you had maybe a wood burning stove or something and you were used to sitting around in a sweatshirt because, you know, my grandpa knew but he wore a sweatshirt all the time in his house. He, he was going to be chilly sometimes. There's a lot of air moving through there. Well, we have decided that we want to sit in our shorts all year round, and we don't want to pay a huge energy bill because all of the air is moving in and out of our building. So we've changed. Therefore, our houses have had to change. So what did we do to those houses to meet those changes? We added better windows. We added some more insulation. We built things tighter so all the air wasn't leaking out that we were heating and cooling. But then our houses still were having some troubles uh, staying comfortable and being durable and, and efficient. So, so what happened? We, we had to start taking a look at things as a, as a house, as a system. How do all these things, maybe, maybe I need to think about, I put in this bad window how does that affect my mechanical equipment? Oh, I had to put in a bigger piece to make up for all the all the heat that I'm getting, you know, losing. Or maybe uh, I put in these really horrible lighting, and so now the, the lights are putting off a lot of heat. And now I got to make that up with my cooling system. Uh, so we just started thinking, well, maybe we don't need to look at each component. Does this have good insulation? Does this have good R value, U factor? We need to look at the whole building. How does the whole building look uh, together? So that kind of system thinking uh, brought us to the performance path. So we have this performance path is, uh, that looks at things, uh, how the whole house is going to perform after we put everything into it. It allows the uh, trade-offs that we use like in the UA path where you could uh, trade insulation for for windows, you could trade R and U factors, but it also brings in, maybe I'm going to trade off a little bit of my air infiltration. Maybe I'm going to build a tighter house than I was supposed to. How will that help me uh, maybe offset my windows or my insulation? How will a tighter duct or better lighting, how will all of this uh, play into effect? So that's how the performance back comes into play. It takes that same twin house concept that we used in the UA path, but it, it compares uh, the house built to the prescriptive path versus the house that you want to build. How do they compare? How does this one com perform uh, in relation to this one? And it's based on cost, so it's annual energy cost. How much would the house built to code be versus uh, to the prescriptive path, B versus what I really wanted to. Which one, as long as what I'm wanting to build will cost less in enter annual energy cost than the one built to the prescriptive requirement, then I'm okay, equal to or less. And so it's based on how much uh, will the annual energy cost be. The code has some strict requirements on documentation and compliance. It gives you some strict requirements on what the Software tools can uh, have to do. Some common software tools out there are uh, REM, rate, uh, REM design, energy gauge, uh, common software tools for this path. 
It also gives you very specifics on what the compliance reports have to tell you. I have to tell you, you know, which code edition that I use, what are the address, what, what went into that standard reference design, what went into what I proposed to do. And so it gives you very specific requirements uh, on what the reports have to say. It's handy because these reports will tell me, okay, here are my heating and cooling and water heating uh, uh, appliances. Here's how much they would cost if I used these according to the 2015 requirements. But here's what I'm proposing to do. So here's my annual energy cost, $945 for annual energy cost. I was lower than the 1008 that it would have been if I had built it to code, so I'm okay. And so it gives you it gives you the actual cost. It gives it does it for your lights, it does it for other things. It also tells you here's all the mandatory requirements of the code that I've met or exceeded and, and I'm good. I've met my 2015 energy code and I actually exceeded it by six point three percent. So it, it's nice that the reports show this. Very important that your report, no matter what you get, uh, shows you that they are complied using the code that you're on. Many times I get a performance report on a project and they say, well, it complied with the 2012 code, but there are, this jurisdiction is on the 2015. Make sure it complies with that code. You're verifying compliance with the code and not based on a HERS index score or some kind of energy rating index score. This, a lot of times the, the reports will print out a score but that, that has nothing to do with code compliance. It's based on does it meet the mandatory requirements and, and all of the requirements uh, for the code edition that you're on. So be sure to, to check that. You get a certificate at the end that says you've complied and it tells you everything that went into the house and uh, all of your duct leakage results, your air leakage results for the envelope. All of those are on there, which is great. It lets you know if you've met or exceeded the code. Always make sure somebody signs it. It also gives you other information, like what were those blower door results? What kind of duct leakage did you have? And what kind of ventilation requirement did you have? Did you use an exhaust only strategy, a supply only strategy, or some kind of combination system? So this is handy that this report um, specifies that. And then it also, you know, usually will print out when you're using these kind of software packages that I showed you, um, these also print out those mandatory uh, certificates that tell you that you met with, met or exceeded the code, what values went in there, what your heating and cooling uh, efficiencies were, that these are all a mandatory in the code that you provide this certificate, so it's nice that this program does that. So that's a simulated performance path. Now, new to the 2015 for residential, you have this ERI path, this Energy Rating Index path. Uh, and so it takes that score, and now you verify compliance based on the score. And so uh, pretty common, uh, you're, you, if you dealt with Energy Star or uh, even some of the old uh, reports on the simulated performance path, you get a HERS score or you get an energy score. And so it, it takes the home and says, okay, if I'm a standard home, I'd be at about a score of 100, a code house, uh, and a zero would be net energy. I need to be somewhere in between there. And it varies depending on which code edition you're on. But this one, uh, in, there was, because of the way that we hear these items when we're writing this code, there were, uh, it was written kind of towards the end of the, of the code hearing, and so there were uh, some sections in there that didn't line up after we got all done. So really want to point out that every code could have some errata to it. You know, they print the code and then we start using it and we find, oh, maybe this should have been a comma instead of a period, or maybe this should have been a less than sign instead of a greater than sign, <laughs> or, or in the case of this, uh, ERI path, there was, uh, it looked like the mandatory requirements of the code were no longer required. But that was just because of the way it all happened at the code hearing. But truly, the mandatory items are required, so be sure to go down and go to iccsafe.org and download your errata for your code to find, um, at a minimum, that the mandatory items do still comply.
will have to apply when you use this ERI tag. So what are the mandatory items? If you're using this ERI pass, you have to meet the air changes. You still have to do your blower door testing. You still have to come in at 5 ACH if you're in climate zones 1 and 2, and 3 ACH for 3 through 8. So you still have to meet those requirements. Something a little bit different uh, with this pass is that for the mandatory, it's mandatory that your building envelope, you know, it's got trade-offs built in, but you cannot trade worse than the 2009 IECC for your envelope. So how, what does that look like? Well, here I have overlaid the, I, the 2015 and uh, 2009 IECC tables. So you can see in climate zones 1, 2, 3, and even 4, there's some trade-off still there. I mean, you know, the 2009 said you could have a 0 0.30 window. The 2015 says 0.25. So you still have a little bit of trade built in there. You have some trade in your walls in some of these climate zones as you start getting into the more heating dominated climate, you're running out of some of the trade. Uh, but so there's very little trade off. The worst you can do in your thermal envelope using this path is this 2009 uh, prescriptive requirement. The reference designs so in that twin house concept, the, the reference house is, is based on the 2006 Energy Conservation Code. So what that's saying is the software is comparing everything that you do to that 2006 code. So the 2009 uh, you know, DOE determination was between 15 and 17 percent above the 2000 or the, above the 2006, and then we got maybe another 15% from the 9 to the 12. And so we're looking at what everything's based off of that 06. How much more efficiency did we get to that 06 in the software? It's looking at a, it's a, as a, at a rating. So now we have this PERS rating that comes into effect, this energy score has to be uh, the score is what gives us compliance, not necessarily the uh, which code we went on. So a lot of the same idea behind this, the, the performance uh, path, it's just that you can't do worse than the 2009 and you have to use a score for compliance. And so where do you fall on that score uh, with the standard home being the 2006 code? So you have the ERI, you have the twin house, one being the 2006, then the house that I want to build, just tell it how you want to build it, but you can't do worse than the 2009 envelope, and you have to do the mandatory requirement. So the score of the desired house needs to come in, uh, uh, whatever it, it prescribed for the table of the code. So what does that table look like? If you're in climate zone 1 on 2, you, you would need to come in with a score of 52, and it varies by climate zone. So here in Colorado, I'd need a score of 55 in order to pass this. 55 meaning, okay, on a score of 100, if I got a score of 55, I'm 45% better than the 2006. So, um, a score of 55 here, people say, well, what you, how come I have to have such a low score? Uh, and uh, Because there's more trade-offs built into this path. If you look at it, equipment trade-offs got built back in. So you could, you could lower your score by putting in a higher efficiency piece of equipment. You could lower your score by putting in some renewables you could, or some PV. You could lower your score by, you know, maybe if you're required to have three air changes per hour, but you make your house at one air change per hour, you could lower your score by uh, taking credit for that extra 2 ACH, or you were required to have four CSM duct leakage, but you came in at two. You know, you could, you could all of these things can lower your score, and so um, that's why you have that kind of low score that you have to reach. So those are the main paths through the residential code. Um, lots of different ways to get what you need to get. A lot of different paths and a lot of different things. Um, it's, it's getting easier and easier to build the house you want to build. Uh, maybe not as easy to go prescriptive, 
maybe if you choose at least a UA alternative with RegCheck or you go in at one of these performance tests, a lot easier to start building the house that you want to build. Let's look at some commercial buildings. So commercial buildings come in at, uh, with a few paths as well. You have the code would allow you to just use ASHRAE 90.1 in lieu of the IECC. So you can use ASHRAE 90.1 and be deemed to comply with the IECC. You have to use ASHRAE 90.1 for the entire building, meaning the envelope, the mechanical, the water heating, and the lighting. You can't mix and match. If you go to ASHRAE 90.1, that's one compliance path. Or you could choose a prescriptive path. So the prescriptive path is there. Um, and People always say, well, okay, you have prescriptive or performance. Where does com check and all of that fit in? We're going to talk about that today, so um, don't worry about it. So you have this prescriptive path. One thing to keep in mind is we needed to get commercial buildings kind of were lacking for a little while, lacking behind the residential buildings when it came to efficiency. We had so much focus on residential, we kind of forgot commercial for a little while. We needed to get some efficiency that from the 2009 to the 2012 we said, we got to get better efficiency out of this building. And so it could have been done a couple ways. One, we could have just really cranked down all the numbers for your envelope, your mechanic, all the requirements. We could have just cranked that down by, say, 15%. But instead of doing that, in keeping with the intent of providing flexibility and, and encouraging innovation and technology, we said, okay, we'll crank down a little bit of the way, and then we're going to give you a choice in how to get through the rest of the way. You choose, you, it's mandatory, if you go prescriptive, it's mandatory that you choose one of these options, but you get to choose how you want to get the rest of the way there. So prescriptive has comply with all of the envelope mechanical water heating and lighting requirements, plus choose one of these additional efficiency package options. You can build performance, which again is based on cost, what the annual energy cost of the building uh, is the way you propose it uh, compared to as if you built it to code, to the prescriptive requirement of code. Um, in this, in the 2015, it says you have to come in at, at least 15% better than your standard reference design. People always say, wait a minute, I thought this was minimum code. Why do I have to be 15% above? It's not that you have to be 15% above code. It means you have to be 15% above this standard reference design because this standard reference design doesn't have these additional efficiency option packages built into it. So we have to get, in order for the prescriptive and the performance to be equal, we need to be 15% above the standard reference design. Um, because we have to replace the fact that we don't have these additional options that are mandatory. All right, so let's look through, let's walk through this prescriptive code real quick and talk about these efficiency options. So I've gone through, I've met all of my mechanical envelope, water heating and lighting requirements out of the base code, and then I get to C406 and I have to pick one of these. It's mandatory. I have to either go in and put in 10% more efficient mechanical, or I can do 10% more efficient lighting. So instead of one watt per square foot, I do 0.9 watts per square foot. Or I do enhanced lighting controls, maybe some digital, some, some, uh, some kind of enhanced control system that will lower my lighting use by 10%. Maybe I can use on-site renewable. You do renewables, it has to be on site. It can't be like this solar farm somewhere. We're talking about on site. Or a, or a dedicated outdoor air system where the outdoor air is coming in and is being treated separately uh, than, the H, than the heating and, and cooling equipment. I have this dedicated system that runs quite efficiently. Or if I'm a, an occupancy that uses a lot of water, maybe a hotel, a hospital, those kind of occupancies, I could choose a more efficient uh, hot water system, so maybe some solar thermal or something. So there's different options. 2012 had three options. 2015, six. So we want to provide flexibility, provide options. Uh, and, and instead of us mandating how you get somewhere, we give you the option. How do you want to get there? 
if you were already going to put in a really efficient piece of equipment, then there, you've already met the requirement to choose that one. So a lot of people are doing better enhanced lighting controls nowadays or better lighting with LEDs and everything else. So just choose those options uh, if you were already going to do that. So that's mandatory. That's how you do the prescriptive requirement. You have this prescriptive table just like we did in the residential where you have this R value table, gives you, uh, breaks it up, here's all your components, here's your climate zones, and, and you just have to do what's on here prescriptively if you want. You know, I hardly ever see anybody use this table, especially for metal buildings because they don't want to do a double layer insulation system or they, but maybe somebody doesn't want to do slab edge insulation. How do you do that? You use a different pack if you want to get out of those requirements. Prescriptively, I do what it says in this table. I have the R value table. I also have that same U factor table. I can look at my component as an assembly, the entire assembly, instead of just the insulation I put on top of that component. In both residential and commercial, I would say don't forget that every component on this table has a code section that goes with it. So you can't get all of the information you want to just out of the table. You do have to go to some of the uh, code sections to find out that, oh, this slab on grade insulation means top of the slab down and it doesn't mean insulate under the whole slab or, or this, you know, there, there are just different requirements that you need to make sure you're reading the whole. The code section. So you still have those same alternatives just like you did. Then you say, well, where does ComCheck fit into all of this? Uh, there are some alternate U factor, C factor, F factor, C factor um, paths that you can choose. So the code does give you this ComCheck path. One thing that I'll point out when you're using ComCheck. It does allow trade offs, and, and a lot of times people think, well, I can, you know, I can trade off my lighting for my envelope. This is, ComCheck is allowing you to trade off within your building envelope. I can trade my windows and my doors and my insulation and all those things that are in the envelope. I can trade those off. It prints out compliance reports for mechanical as well as lighting, but it's not trading it all off. So, um, it's, more, it's allowing the trade-offs in the envelope. I love ComCheck. You can do you can do this code. You can do this U factor table and calculate the entire U factor for your entire building if you want to do that. You have to show how you came up with those U factors. How did you how did you come up with the U factor for each layer of your assembly as well as for the entire building? You could do that, but why? when you could go to DOE's website at energycodes.gov and download the software for free and use it. It's a great software. I, I don't know a jurisdiction that doesn't allow it from even required. Uh, and so it's drop down menus. Make sure you're on the latest edition. You've chosen the right code. It, you've told it everything about your project. And right here, remember I said you have to if you go uh, with this path, if you're not using performance, you have to choose one of those uh, efficiency options in C406. This one, you can go into contract and it'll tell you, you can go in there and choose which one so that it'll tell you um, what your requirements are as you get into those different components. So it's really great. It's a great uh, tool with a lot of drop down menus. It's easy to use. So you go in and you, you're in the envelope and you just pick which component you're looking at and it has a bunch of drop downs. Here I have a solid concrete wall. Okay, well look at all of the different options and it's going to give me a different U factor based on is it partially grouted or fully grouted or, you know, or empty or, and so it's calculating the U factor behind the scenes uh, with U factors from uh, Ashray Handbook of Fundamentals. So there's all kinds of um, easy to use drop down menus. I can tell it here's the type of building that I'm using. Here's my interior lighting method. I chose the building area method, or I'm going to use the space by space method, and then it gives you all the drop downs that you need. I mean, it's, you're just going in there and telling it everything about your building, and it's doing all the calculations for you behind the scenes. So easy to use. Uh, 
exterior lighting. You can evaluate exterior lighting in it. What I love about it is this help menu. So you have this help menu. I'm in here in my envelope, and I have this question about, I see that I have to tell it what my projection factor is. I have no idea what that is. So you go to the windows, you click on it, and look, it tells you here's Here's how you calculate projection factor, and it'll tell you, and it'll give you little boxes to fill in the blanks, and it's so great. Uh, great help menu. If you're going in, you're entering your basement wall. It doesn't really let you fail, so it says, okay, how high of a wall do you have, and how much insulation, and you fill in the blank, and it carries those numbers over and does the calculations for you. If I'm slab on grade, which is one thing that comes in on the plans wrong every time, uh, this one, well, Comcheck won't let you do it wrong practically. You're just it's saying here's here's the slab edge that needs to be insulated. How are you going to do it on the inside or on the outside, and how deep are you going to go with your insulation? What value are you doing? And it gives you all of these handy pictures, fill in the blanks type of thing. It reminds you if you say, oh, I'm putting in, you know. 500 feet of slab insulation, it says, oh, wait a minute, don't forget, this is perimeter only. We're not talking about the slab area. And so it gives you all of these great pop-up tools to use. So really handy. It does say, you know, oh, I chose other. Maybe I have some kind of wall assembly that doesn't meet anything out of their hundreds of drop-down menus. I have this special wall assembly. doesn't mean you can't use it. You would just go in and hit other and say, okay, now I have I've uh, calculated the U factor on my own and I put it in. So it lets you know that if you do that, that's fine. But you have to turn in documentation of how you calculated that U factor to the code official along with your um, comm check. So great. It's uh, great. The, the um, reports turn out wonderful. I always make sure that it's to the right code, that it's in the right climate zone. I love the fact that it tells you what percentage of glazing and skylight you have. So that you can say, oh well, if I stayed under my 30 percent, if I go above 30, I got a whole other set of requirements that kick in for my daylight zone. Uh, here's it's an office, and here's how many square feet I have. I can check that. It tells me which efficiency package I chose, so that I make sure this one says, oh, it went with lighting. So then I go over to my lighting uh, com check and see did they choose lighting. Uh, make sure that they did and that everybody chose the same thing. Um, there are instances maybe when you could have not everybody choosing the same thing. If you were going to choose more than one option, so maybe you're going to put in efficient mechanical and efficient lighting, then the mechanical guy could say he chose efficient mechanical and the lighting could say he chose efficient lighting. What you don't want to happen is for the lighting guy to say, oh, we chose mechanical, and we're just going to use regular lighting. And the mechanical guy to say, oh, we chose more efficient lighting, then they're not complying with anything. So they either all need to say the same thing, or the specific disciplines have to choose their specific um, option. It's just nice that um, you can verify it on all three portions of the comm check. And again, it's just like the, the res check. You go in and you make sure that they're using the right window, uh, window and wall assembly that, they, that the plans say. Make sure the square footage is, um, match or the area matches. The R values and U factors, they, the R values match the details on the plan that the plans say. Sometimes the plans will say, oh, they put in two inches of insulation, uh, continuous insulation on the wall and you go to the res, the com check, and it says, oh, well, they put an R10 on the wall. Okay, well, that probably could be. Um, so just making sure that the details on the plan match the, the com check and the U factors. Did they put in the windows that they said they were going to? Are they counting for the, all of the doors? Making sure, you know, if you look at the plan on the door and it shows 10 exterior doors. Does the com check show 10 doors? And so it's really nice. It's a nice printout of here's my code compliance. Uh, and so it's a great tool for that. It also has mechanical compliance. So again, it, I compare the mechanical comm check to the regular comm check to just make sure that they are um, that they're complying and that they have said, okay, if, if the mechanical sheets show that they put in 20 units, 
and the comp chip says they only put A1, hmm, maybe they need to change their comp chip. But making sure that they match, that the, the size of equipment matches, the efficiency of the equipment matches, and that the number of equipment matches, that their additional efficiency package matches the sensors they're doing the lighting. So go to the lighting comp chip and make sure they chose lighting. I love the mechanical compliance certificate because um, it prints out that inspection checklist. So the inspectors know that here's all the things you need to look at based on the equipment they chose. You don't have to go and worry about going through the entire code for inspections. You can look at, they chose this equipment, so here's the inspections that apply to this equipment. So that's a, a handy thing. Interior lighting, it, it, it evaluates interior lighting and exterior lighting compliance. So um, you can see that here I have, if I'm looking at an interior lighting, I'm looking at an office. This office chose the interior lighting power as their efficiency option. And so ComCheck automatically defaulted to the lower uh, use or a lower wattage. This office chose the high efficiency uh, lighting option or the HVAC option. So there, ComCheck defaulted to a higher value. You can see uh, one defaults to the lower, one defaults to the higher, depending on which op efficiency package option that they chose. So it's important to verify those efficiency package options and that they are using the right one. Great tool tells you, okay, here's your occupancy, here how many watts you're allowed, here's how many watts you're choosing to use, and you, you're using less than, you're staying under budget on your watts, so you're okay. One thing to keep in mind is, it is important to compare uh, these fixtures that they say they're putting in to the lighting plan. I have seen sometimes where they come in and say, okay, well, it says you're using 12 of these fixtures, but when I go to your electric plan, it shows 25 of them. So um, you know, what are you really doing or something? So just important to, com to compare to the plan. Exterior lighting compliance is great. Um, let you see, do you have all of your tradable surfaces, your non-tradable surfaces? How many watts are you allowed for out exterior lighting? Here's your budget. Here's what you're actually installing. Did you stay under budget? Yes, I passed. Okay, excellent. So it's a great compliance tool uh, there. If you were using the prescriptive path and not using ComCheck uh, as a tool, then these are the calculations you would need to also provide in lieu of comp checks. You would need to show, here's how, here's my occupancy, my square footages, here's all of the wattage that I'm allowed, here's all the wattage that I'm using. So you would need to provide the same thing. This is why a lot of people use comp checks because it does it for you. Your other option in the code is to use the performance path. So you have a performance path just like you do in residential based on annual energy costs. You put, it's a computer modeling software. Again, the code gives you strict requirements on what the software has to do, what your reports have to say. You have to meet the manual or the mandatory requirements of the code. And what you're proposing, the building you're proposing to build has to be uh, cost less in annual energy than the same building built to the prescriptive requirements. So it's a lot of the same concept. Uh, just different software. So there's some different software tools out there. Um, not as many people using the performance path as probably could be or should be. <laughs> you could probably do a lot better by making sure your whole building performs and using the software packages. Um, but uh, not a lot of people know how to use them and so sometimes it does cost a little bit more to find somebody that will uh, get you through that performance path on a commercial building. Uh, and so a lot of people default to, to ComCheck to do their commercial compliance. But you do have that option of doing the performance for your commercial buildings. So DOE has some great resources out there. Please take advantage of them. I can't stress to you enough the amount of resources that DOE has available to you. You have resource guides, you have websites that have you know, here's a paper on does this air barrier meet code compliance, and here's how to install this to meet code compliance, or, or you know, here's this, here's some information on thermal bridging. There's so much out there. You download ComCheck and ResCheck for free. 
Um, I downloaded the other day a guide, uh, uh, the guide to HVAC controls for plan reviewers and inspectors. It's a great guide of, oh my goodness, the mechanical control section in commercial is so intense. Well, here's a handy guide of how to get through it. I mean, there's all kinds of tools there, so please take advantage of them. You can go to energycodes.gov, or they also have their resource center and help desk. So that's it for me. So at this point, I think we are going to do questions. Thanks very much for such an informative webinar, Shauna. Boy, you really cranked through all those slides. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we've had several questions come in. Let's see, there actually was a question that came in regarding Florida and Florida's use of ComCheck. So I'll go ahead and take that one and note that yes, Florida's specific code is available in ComCheck now um, with one of the last releases of ComCheck. So you are able to use ComCheck for Florida's 2014 code. All right, so I did get the list of questions, so I'll try to go through them as um, time allows. Oh, I don't even know what time it is. Okay. So, um, the first question is, what about podium construction and or three stories above? So the important thing to remember when you're talking about the energy code is it's dealing with the thermal envelope. It doesn't really necessarily matter how you're building the building. Where is the thermal envelope? What is the portion of the building that separates the conditioned space from the unconditioned space? That assembly has to comply. That component has to comply. Um, if you're going uh, three, above three stories, that's where you use the commercial code to kick in. So it depends on occupancy. Again, so a residential building is anything under the IRC plus your R2, 3s, and 4s, three stories or less. If you're more than three stories on any occupancy, but if you're more than three stories on your R2, 3s, and 4s, and everything else is considered commercial. So if you have more than three stories, you're using the commercial chapters, the C chapters and then your R2, 3s, and 4, or R2, 3s, and 4s, less than three stories, you're using the R chapters. If you have three-story mixed-use building, can you use commercial for the entire building or it's wrong? That depends on your jurisdiction. So right now the code says if you have a mixed-use building, you use the residential chapter for the residential section, you use the commercial chapter for the commercial section if you're three stories or less. Once you go over three stories, it's commercial for everything. Can I use the commercial chapter for everything? That would be a code official requirement. The code, the code doesn't allow it, but that would be up to the code. I have seen some code officials will say, okay, well, I'm not going to require you to do manual duties for the mechanical of the residential units, and then I'm going to require you to do uh, engineered some other engineered load truck for the other mechanical of the other unit. So I'll let you do just an, some engineered load truck for the whole thing. Um, what you want to be careful with is the envelope requirements. Most of the time, people want to use the commercial chapter for the entire building to get out of the required blower door testing. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> and so that's what you have. The code official has to make that determination. Um, I. I do have one code official that lets you, if you're, you know, mixed occupancy or even an R2, three-story or less, let you come in as commercial, but you have to do the entire building as commercial, meaning you have to take that additional efficiency package. You have to do the commissioning and all of the other things that are required. Um, you can't pick and choose the components you want to comply with. But to the letter of the code, you are not complying if you're using um, only the commercial code for that mixed use three stories or less if it contains our occupancy. Does the assembly U factor include convective film coefficients? Rose, you want to cover that? Or Pam? Sorry, read that one again, please. It says, does the assembly U factor include convective film coefficients? I don't think so. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't think so because doesn't the code say that that if you use those films that you don't have to comply? I don't know, but I, I guess I don't know. 
I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but we can find out the end. Where can we get some reliable sources to find the R value for the assemblies? Great question. So you could, if you have access to um, ICC sells this I, IECC actually a 90.1 combined book. Or you can just get, if you just have ASHRAE 90.1, back in the appendix, there are some, um, there are some different things to show you. What is the U value of everything? What is the R value of different things? Um, you can, I think what you really want to know is how do you find the U value of the assemblies because R is, um, R is just based on the insulation. To find the R value, you would go to the manufacturers and see what R value is for their material. U factors for the whole assembly. So if you want to find what is the U factor and how do we break that down, you can get ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals or you could use the appendix in ASHRAE 90.1. They give you um, the U factor for all of these different materials, all of these different construction materials out there so that you could calculate the total for your assembly. Um, where are the requirements for doors and windows when using the R value and U value prescriptive method? Well, it depends on if you're doing commercial or residential for that one. So if you're doing prescriptive, the R value and U factors are in the table. Uh, for residential, it's all in the same table. It'll give you the windows and the doors and the um, walls. If you're in commercial, it depends on if you're opaque or not. So uh, opaque would mean it has 50% or less glass. So uh, if I have a door that has less than 50% glass, it's an opaque door. Is it swinging or not swinging? If it's a swinging door, you're going to find that it in the U factor table. If it's a non-swinging door, you're going to find it in the R factor table or the R value table because those roll-up doors, they come listed as an R value anyway, so if you find that the R4.75 or whatever your requirement is, it's an opaque door because it's less than 50% glass and it's a non-swinging, it's an R value for commercial. If it's an opaque door and it swings, it's in the U factor table. If it has more than 50% glass, it's in the fenestration table, you count it with the rest of your fenestration. That's for commercial. In residential, it's all in the same table. Um, when spray foam, and this is probably a good question for um, Rose, Marie, or Pam. When spray foam is used in the attic, underside of decking, how do we use the res check? I imagine it depends on a few things, but um, Rose, you want to cover that? When spray foam is used in the attic underside of decking, how do we use the res check? You would have to choose other as your assembly type and provide the overall calculated U factor for the assembly. There's not an assembly choice to choose from for insulation underneath the roof deck. So that would be assuming that you have a conditioned attic and there's not an assembly. The assemblies that are that are in the res check pretty much follow the prescriptive assemblies that are in the code. So we are looking at implementing or looking at how we can implement that type of assembly in the res check right now, but we're still researching that. So in the meantime, you'd have to choose other. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Are the checklists only for inspectors? I often send the report and have to put to be determined on items to be installed on a later date. Hmm. So um, the, the checklists aren't just for inspectors. So when you when you submit your, I, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the COM check and res check inspection checklist that get printed once you print your reports. It also prints these inspection checklists. Hopefully you're clicking on that option so that it prints it. It's a valuable tool. You turn those into the building department with your with your um, plans. The inspectors can use them for inspections. But you know, I was just teaching yesterday a class of architects that they 
print it out and use it to make sure they also use it to make sure that they're before they do their final submittal of their plan, they have that checklist and make sure that everything that they called out on the plan um, is matching their comm check. So they use it kind of as a tool to make sure they included everything on the plan. The plan reviewer also can use it as a checklist. So it can be used by um, more than just the inspector. Um, but it is supposed to be signed and you should be checking everything that you're supposed to have to comply with. So I'm not quite sure on this putting uh, to be determined on whether or not they have to install it. I'm not sure whether that's coming into play. Uh, what software is being used to generate a report right now? Oh, as for a re uh, performance report, it depends on which performance software you use, if it's residential or commercial. So it says that um, this question came in while I was showing a performance report. Well, I'm guessing it was a performance report for residential, and that was using REM rate. That was using REM. Those reports that I showed that were from Energy Logic, those were all um, REM reports. That I showed. Um, okay. When prescriptive method is used and a builder insulates more than the minimum required, for example, he R19 walls, but he puts in R30, can we still use prescriptive or change to other methods? No. So you the code is set up so that you can always do better than code. You can always go better than code. You just can't do worse. So that table. The, that prescriptive table is the worst you can do and still get away with it, <laughs> right? You, can, you just want to do, if you want to do, our, our value is the higher the number, the better. U factor is the lower the number, the better. So if it's R19 and you put it on R30, great. You don't have to bump to another path. If you want to get credit for that to trade out of something else, you need to use a different path. But if you just want to do better, you, you can do better all day long. I would say that whether you're doing better or worse, it is very important that you let your mechanical guy know so that he's designing a piece of equipment based on what you're actually doing and not what just what they think the code is. If you say, I'm going to go prescriptive, then that mechanical guy is using you know, 0.32 for your windows and R19 in your walls or whatever the requirement is for your climate zone. But if you're doing better than that, he could be designing a piece of equipment that is not going to work efficiently and will be too big. So make sure, no matter what you're doing, that you're uh, communicating with the designer. What justification do you have for including solar? The code doesn't contain any reference to solar at all. Residentially, that is true. Residentially, there's not really any mention of solar. All I said, all I mean is, when you're using the performance approach, the software will give you in the ERI path. It will allow you to lower your score if you use some PV. That that's in the software that is, and it, and it's, I believe it might be in the tables um, of what can go into the the um, standard reference design. When you're using commercial, there's, um, there is, solar is mentioned in, so it's, it's mentioned in renewables. You have to use, a, if you choose that additional efficiency package of a renewable, then it gives you a specific amount of how much that renewable needs to do uh, to save energy. So you're right, the only mention of, of solar in the residential is if you use that ERI path, and commercial is in there if you um, choose renewables as one of your options, or if you use the performance path, it might have an effect on your performance. Where is the requirement for mandatory maximum ACH50 values in the ERI path? So that is... Oh, I had that slide, but I don't, I don't have it in front of me. So let me look that up in the code. So if you are in the code and you chose the ERI path, which is in section 406, 
remember, you have to download the errata. You have to download the errata to see that the mandatory requirements of the code are still in there. That's where it's at. Because the way that it's 2015 is currently written, it's referencing some code sections that, are, that used to say mandatory, and now it doesn't. And so there's an errata saying, fixing all of that. So please go to iccsafe.org and download that errata. Then you will see the man, if you choose the ERI path, the mandatory requirements of 402, 403, and 404 are still uh, in effect. You have to do the blower door testing. You have to do the ACH 50 because that is a mandatory requirement. And, and so that's why it's confusing if you're just looking at um, R406 right now because it's, it's referencing some different code sections. So download the errata, then you'll get the right code section. Oh, well, let's see. I'm hearing of areas, areas in Minnesota, climate zone six and seven. Well, that's where my boss is today teaching. He says it's 12 degrees. <clears throat> where continuous insulation is being required per table C402.133. Can you confirm that continuous insulation is not required when using the UA complex? Okay. All I can tell you is what the code will allow. Jurisdictions are allowed to over, you know, to amend and, and, and do things to their code based on what they feel is right for their climate zones and, and for their community. Right now, if you're using table C402.1.3 and you're using a certain kind of wall, you have to use continuous insulation. Um, and if, you're, if you use the UA or component or you use ComCheck or you use performance or you use one of those other paths, you could, by the letter of the code, trade out of those. Uh, and say, okay, well, I, I'm going to make it up somewhere else in the building. By the letter of the code, that is true. There are, but you have to check with the jurisdiction to see if they've overridden that and amended it. To, uh, it could be very likely that Minnesota has said, no, we're not going to let you trade out of that. I, I don't know that for sure, but that could, uh, that could very well happen. How do you justify including solar in the ERI? Um, <laughs> I'm not justifying anything. I'm telling you what is allowed right now. There are ma I can tell you that there are many, many we're writing the 2018 code right now. There are many proposals to either allow solar or not allow solar. We'll see where that ends up. Right now, the software that's used does allow you to put some solar in there and reduce your score. I'm not saying that's good or not. I'm not justifying one way or another. I need to hear the argument at the code hearing next month or in April. But uh, so I don't know what those arguments are. I am not justifying them. <laughs> when does an existing building renovation need to install an additional efficiency package option? Well, if you go to see, if, if you go, we're talking about existing buildings or like a commercial building. When does a commercial addition or remodel? Uh, 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 no, when does it a commercial building renovation, not an addition, but a renovation, need to comply with the efficiency package? So you go to Chapter C5. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm just keep talking until they tell me I have to stop. Um, we go to Chapter C5, and we're looking at renovations. It's very specific to tell us which sections of the code we have to comply with. So if you're in C5, Sorry, I'm just in my code here, and I'm on renovation, which is section C503, alterations. It'll tell me which sections of the code I have to. It says alterations uh, complying with ASH rate don't have to comply with these codes, but the rest of this says um, you have to comply as if you were new construction, and I mean, if, if the building envelope has to comply with 402.1 through 402.5. And it gives you your lighting. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't stay anywhere in there on an alteration that you have to comply with C406. It 
if, if you're mechanical, you have to comply with 403. If you're lighting, you've got to comply with 405. If you're in an envelope, you comply with 402. And it gives you times when you don't have to and times when you do have to. But nowhere in there does it say you have to comply with C406. So existing buildings, if you're doing an alteration to an existing building, you do not have to go in there and pick one of those additional efficiency package options. It would be quite hard to do to figure out which package option is going to serve the entire building now that you're remodeling it. So it's not a requirement um, for existing alteration. All right, you've already answered the Florida question. How does ComCheck get accepted if it does not, if it does a budget type analysis which allows for non-compliant window U factor and there isn't a total UA alternative like the residential code? There is a total UA alternative. It is section, well, I, I have to back up for a second. It's hard, I, I get that it's a little bit hard. If you're not on the 15, it's a little bit harder to find it. But it is allowed because there is a C402.1.5, I want to say, but I'm going to look it up so I don't misquote. Uh, if you're looking in the commercial chapter under C402, because we're in the building envelope, and if you look at, they have 40213, which is your R value method. You have 40214, which is your U factor, C factor, and F factor method. And you have 40215, which is your component performance alternative. You could get comp check out of this 40214 and 40215 uh, saying, Show me the alternate, what is my U factor or my C factor or my F factor alternative? That's where ComCheck fits into play, is under those tabs. So there is a requirement. It just does, they don't call it UA alternative like they do in the residential because they're looking at more than just U. They're looking at U, C, and F. So it's the U, C, and F. Now, Pam and Rose can correct me if I totally blew that up. up. <laughs> well, just a little. So, ComCheck <laughs> uses ASHRAE Appendix C methodology, and it's okay. based on energy performance factor. So, it's looking at a budget building, um, proposed budget, overall budget factor. So, really, it's not just UA. There's a lot more involved in the calculations. Best place to go is to the technical support document that's out there on the energycodes.gov website, but also to have ASHRAE 90.1 and go to Appendix C and all the assemblies and the calculations that are used in the back end of ComCheck are part of that appendix. Great. Awesome. How do you know when a renovation or alteration is required to comply with the code? If you're in the 2000 and Anything before the 15, you're going to find it in Chapter 1. It says if you're in alteration, addition, or uh, historic building, those are all in Chapter 1 of what has to comply or not. Pretty much it just says you have to comply it if you were new construction unless you meet one of these exceptions. The 2015 brought in that, that existing building's chapter. So it says if you go to C5, like if you're a commercial building, you'd go to Chapter C5. If you're residential, you'd go to R5, and it will tell you in there. If you're an addition, here's everything that has to comply. And if you're an alteration, here's everything that has to comply. If you're a repair, here's everything that has to comply. If you're a historic building, here's everything that has to comply. So it lays it out for you uh, rather nicely in the um, 2015 code. What is turning out to be the least costly way to get a metal building roof to comply? Well, <laughs> You know, whenever you have metal in your building, then you have some thermal loss. And so, yeah, the code gets pretty uh, restrictive and says, you know, you need to put the double layer system and you need to put in more insulation. You need to have some continuous insulation in there. So there's some different requirements for metal building. Not everybody likes to do them. In fact, I've, I think probably once in all of my plan reviews have I ever seen a metal building come in meeting the prescriptive requirements with the double layer system. Most people use ComCheck or the performance uh, approach to, to get out of that, to find a different way uh, to comply with their metal building. They make it up somewhere else in the building. Um, 
we could sit here all day and talk about whether that's good or bad, but what it does is it allows you to make it up somewhere else in the building and not do the double layer system on commercial uh, that is required. So uh, to tell you the least costly way, I don't know, because there's probably so many different insulations out there. There's so many different ways we could look at it. Do I put in a better window? Do I make up the insulation here or there? Or what kind of insulation do I use? There's so many different things that could go into that. Um, I don't know. I just know usually people trade out of it using um, one of the alternate paths. Let's see. I think I have two more questions. Insulated overhead door companies often don't report effective U values or R values, but just a nominal door panel R values. How do you suggest converting this effective U value for com checks? M? <laughs> So R is one over U, U is one over R. I don't know. You could use the reciprocal of it. However, depending on the door, you are still, there's requirements that there's a rating that's been tested through NFRC. So if this is a glass door, greater than 50% glass, then if it's not tested and certified through NFRC, then you're having to use the default tables that are in the code. And those default values are actually embedded in the comp check. However, they're worst case scenarios. And most of them do not even meet the prescriptive values in the climate zones. So the best option is, is to truly, when you're looking at fenestration and doors, is to look at what the requirements are as far as if there has to be a rated, certified, labeled product. And if not, will those default values work for that building or can you trade them off? Because you would have to look at making up the difference for those worst case scenario uh, ratings, that those default values. Yeah, usually if you have to use the read default values, you don't have a very good chance of your prompt check passing. <laughs> you really have to make it up somewhere else. And the, one thing I would caution about using default values too is if you don't know the U factor or the authority can coefficient, then you have to use the, the default. Keep in mind that that's also what the mechanical guy is going to use for his calculations. So when you end up putting in, you know, you say you're going to use a default value of maybe it's a 0.55, um, but you end up putting in a truly a 0.35, then the mechanical guy who's used 0.55 in all his calculations uh, could have some oversized equipment. So it does become really important to verify everything that we possibly can. The last question that I have is <laughs> a tricky one, right? So must licensed engineers turn in calcs that will be reviewed by someone who is not an engineer? You know, that's, that's how it is in the code everywhere. Uh, you know, you turn in structural calculations, calculation, mechanical load calculations. I'm not an engineer, but I review them all day long because I know what goes into them. I, I, I can't create them, but I, I know what goes into them. I, at a minimum, I could say, did you use the right climate zone in your load calcs? Did you use the right U factors and, and R, R values and, and elevations and heating degree days and cooling degree, did you use all of the right stuff that went in there? I don't have to be an engineer to see what values you use. Um, and so that happens all day. Not all plan reviewers are engineers, but we still look at your calc. Some jurisdictions say turn in a stamp, whatever it is, and they just look to see that it has a stamp and they leave it. And some, uh, I get plans in all of a sudden and have an engineer stamp on them and I review them. Most engineers will say, oh, thanks for the second set of eyes. You know, uh, I'll say, wow, this, this span is kind of big. The table says I can span this far. You're showing this. Oh, yeah, good catch. You know, uh, others don't want you looking at their stuff. So it just, just depends. Um, it's just the way the code is. There's no way that a building department could stay in business if they had to hire nothing but engineers to look at everything. <laughs> um, so I don't know a great answer for that. But that's all the questions that I have. I don't know if you got more. Uh, there were a few more that unfortunately we're not going to have time to get to since we're at the end of our time. But thanks, Shauna. You did a great job. Uh, presenting and getting through that long list of questions. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it and we hope that you'll continue to join us as the Energy Code Commentator Series continues again 
the second Thursday um, of every month, we'll have a different topic. And the U.S. Department of Energy is building energy codes program. Thank you for your attendance today.